number one, two, one, two. Test and test and one, two. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I can't see. All right. Um, it's an honor to be back in Detroit. I think this is my fifth visit. So I'm getting more familiar with the city. For those of you who are at the meeting of the minds, follow up that we had at the Dexter Elmhurst Center, you heard me say that I'm looking to relocate to either Detroit or Chicago to complete the requirements for me to get my license as a psychologist, which would allow me to build HMOs and all that kind of thing. Not that I really plan on doing that, because most of my work is in the schools, but it wouldn't hurt to have it for later on. Because school is about to get started, I cannot have any presentation that doesn't deal with miseducation of the young people as a starter. So I want to start with that, and then we'll get it into more politically oriented topics. But I want to deal with the children first. By a show of hands, who here has a child in their life? your own biological child or a child that you care about who's going to be going to pre-K through 12th grade this school year. Okay, that's most of you. And the hands that shouldn't have went up probably should have. Because I don't know who in here should not have a child that you care about. Niece, nephew, somebody on the block, so when you don't see a hand at all, that makes me concerned that some of us are being a little selfish with our time and our commitment. So what I want to do to start is I want to go over the psychological evaluation process. Now for those of you who have my book, you probably have read some of this in the book. And for those of you who have it, you'll get it for the first time. But this is information you can use. Totally relevant, totally applicable immediately. Okay, so let's talk about the psychological evaluation process for children. And if you don't have the book, you'll be able to purchase it tonight. It's on the table over there, along with many of my different DVD products. So let's talk about psychology, the eval. Let me first... Okay, just a sec. Okay. Okay. Why do we evaluate children? Four reasons, and only four reasons why we evaluate children in school educationally or at the clinic clinically. Four reasons why children are psychologically evaluated. I want you to know the four reasons. Number one, to get information that we don't know. You sign permission for your son to get tested in school for special ed or out of school for mental disorder. In school, psychoeducationally, out of school, clinically. Because you think there might be something going on, but you're not sure. So you're looking for information you don't already know. Now some of you would say, why do you even mention that? Common sense says that I only get my child evaluated if I need to know something that I don't know. That's common sense, but that's not common practice. Many of you get your children evaluated for problems that you already know why they exist. Let me give you an example. You want your son evaluated for ADHD. You want to see if he has ADHD. But the real reason why he can't sit still is because his father is incarcerated and you won't take him to go see his dad. So he goes to school and acts out his frustration. You know that's why he's not sitting still. You know he don't have ADHD. But because you don't want to accept and admit to yourself that you're the reason why he's acting like that, you cross your fingers sign permission for the psychologist, me, to come in and test your child, hoping that I come to a conclusion other than what you already know. In other words, some of us get our kids evaluated looking for an excuse for us not to do what we're supposed to do. Are y'all following me? Yes. 
Your child's grades are struggling. Your child goes to bed 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, whenever they feel like it. He's failing all four classes. Dr. Umar, evaluate Raheem to see if Raheem has a reading disability. Well, Raheem only gets four hours of sleep at night. So his grades are struggling because he's only getting four hours of sleep at night. If the brain doesn't have enough energy, it doesn't operate correctly, no matter how smart you are. And on top of that, he doesn't get breakfast. And if he does eat breakfast in the morning, it ain't nothing but one of them sugar-packed cereals that pick him up and drop him by 10 in the morning. Here we go again. Another example of you getting a child evaluated for a problem you already know you caused. How about sending him to bed on time? How about not giving him sugar for breakfast? So number one speaks to you not getting our children tested unless you're absolutely certain you don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Most of the time, we know why they're doing what they're doing. But we don't want to take responsibility. So we're hoping the psychologist gives us another excuse. Half the times I sit down with a child, half the times I sit down with a child, I'm like, why are they sitting in front of me? This kid been to five different schools in three years. Why am I looking for a learning disability for a child who's been to five different schools in three years? He hasn't received consistent instruction. Of course his grades are gonna be low. Of course his skill levels are gonna be low because he ain't been nowhere long enough to learn nothing. Are y'all following me on this? Yes. We already know why. Why is he getting tested? Why are we risking a misdiagnosis? when we know we the cause of it. Reason number two, you get your children evaluated because you want more information about the problem that you do know exists. Now this is a little different. Number one, you don't know what the problem is. Number two, you know what the problem is, but you want more information. Dr. Umar, my son is autistic. He has autism, but I'm not sure if he's more Asperger's which is a high-functioning autistic child, or if he's more of a traditional, average, or low-functioning autistic kid. I need more information about his autism. My son has a reading disability, but I don't know if his problem is comprehension, or is it fluency, or is it basic reading skills. So I know he got a reading problem, but I need you to help me narrow it down to what area. So we know the problem, but we need more information about it. That's reason number two. Reason number three, to determine if he has a special education disorder or mental illness. Special education disability or mental illness. Psychology has what? Two major sides. Over this side is clinical psychology. Over this side is school psychology. School psychology is the psychology of special ed. Mental disorder, that's the psychology of ADHD, schizophrenia, depression, borderline, bipolar. If you already graduated from high school, we don't have to question whether or not you're getting tested for a learning disability or not. Because if you're already out of high school, you don't get special ed no more. There is no special ed in college. So if you say I got tested, I automatically know it's for a mental disorder because you're out of school. Only kids in school get tested for learning disabilities. Okay? So if the child is still in school, then I'm going to ask you, was this a special ed evaluation or was this a psychological clinical eval? Was he tested to see if he needs special ed or was he tested to see if he needs therapy? Special ed, psycho ed eval, we tested to see if you need special ed. Clinical evaluation, we tested to see if you need therapy, hospitalization, or psychiatric medication. Okay? When you're testing for special ed, you're testing to see if there's trouble learning. In school, we only tested to see if there's trouble learning. Outside of school, we tested to see if they got problems getting along with people, problems getting along with themselves, if they're suicidal, homicidal. Outside of school, you look at everything. Can they carry on a job? In school, 
do they have trouble learning? Now, you see a group of letters. Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. That is special ed law. That is the special ed law of America right now. Whenever you see this, this is the special ed law. Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act 2004. That's the law. It's called special ed, but that's the code that regulates it. Over here, you see Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is clinical psychology. In fact, I need to change this because it's no longer four. We now have DSM number five. And if you're raising a black boy, you need to get on over to Borders or Barnes and Noble or wherever and get you a copy of the DSM-5 so you have the most recent criteria for ADHD conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder. You need the information. You need the information. A parent who doesn't know is a dangerous parent. A parent who don't know what ADHD is is a dangerous parent. A parent who don't know what a learning disability is is a dangerous parent. A parent who doesn't know the definition, the federal definition of mental retardation is a dangerous parent. Why am I saying that? Because if you don't know what it is, the school can make you think it's anything they want it to be. If you don't know what it is, the school can make you think it's anything they want it to be. Let me give you an example. Reading disability. The most popular disorder in the world of education. 85% of kids sent for testing are sent for reading. Now what is the definition of a reading disability? According to the feds, it is a child who has a psychological problem being able to learn and retain reading information. They can't pick up the skill. It is psychologically based, it is neurological, it is brain based. So for me to diagnose your son with a reading disability, I must have evidence that his brain has trouble picking up the words and converting them into meaning. I must have scientific proof, or I should, that something ain't working here in the acquisition and retention of new information. But is that how your public school decides if you got a learning disability? No, they look at one thing. How much behind grade level is your son? That's all they care about. Raheem is in the fifth grade, he's reading on the third. Shanique was in the eighth grade, she's reading on the fourth. They don't go through the work of seeing if there's a learning problem. They look at how far the child is behind grade level and conclude because of the deficit that there's a learning disability present. That's why y'all need to know what it is. A skills delay is not a learning disability. A skills delay, your child could be in the eighth grade doing math on the fourth grade level. That's four levels below grade. But do they have a learning disability? Not unless the reason they're behind is due to the fact they can't learn math. But if the child is behind for other reasons, they don't get to school on time. Other reasons, you don't make them do homework or check it. Other reasons, they have a terrible math teacher. Are the reasons they're suspended from school so much they're not in class long enough to learn anything. Are the reasons they go to a school that's considered highly violent or a school that hasn't made AYP in years. Your child is at a failing school and you're getting them tested for special ed. Your child is at an underperforming Detroit inner city public school and you're going to let them test the child who you know is not receiving an adequate education? Does that make any sense? The child ain't being taught. So why are you letting them get tested for if you know they're not being taught? A learning disability means the child can't learn. It does not mean he's not being taught. And the biggest disorder in our community 
It's what I refer to as ABT. Ain't been the hell taught. The average black kid in special ed is ABT. They never been taught how to read effectively. They never been taught how to count. They never been taught how to write. But the problem is black parents, you all, are so willing to just let the psychologist take a chance on your child's future. Y'all call me up, Dr. Umar, I want my son out of special ed. Can you help me? Why is he in special ed in the first place? Let's start there. Well, the school is, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, why did you give permission to Detroit public schools to test your African-American son to see if he had a learning disability if you knew he didn't have one? That's your fault. That's your fault. You start the ball rolling, and I need y'all to know that. Parents and grandparents and foster parents and caregivers, aunts and uncles with primary physical custody, you guys are my problem because the system can't miseducate without your permission. Every special ed child, everyone in America, is in special ed because their parents gave permission for the school psychologist to see if this son got a learning problem. Well, Dr. Umar, what's wrong with letting them see? Don't I need to know if he got a learning disability? Yeah, problem is what? There's no objective way of verifying whether he has one or not. The learning disability is not scientifically proven. The learning disability is not scientifically proven. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm saying that you can't prove he got it, and I can't prove he ain't got it. It is the opinion of the school psychologist that your son can't read. It is not a fact. It is the opinion of the school psychologist that your daughter can't count. It is not a fact. So when you say, I just wanted them to see if he had a problem with reading, to see if he had a learning disability, my question is, are you aware that they can't prove it one way or the other? Are you aware that the diagnoses we use at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, are nothing more than professional opinions? Your son is on Ritalin right now, killing his brain cells because of somebody's opinion. Your son is on Adderall right now, messing up his liver because of somebody's opinion. Your daughter is on Ritalin. Or your grandson is on Prozac or Risperdal or Depakote, not because there's some type of test that shows the brain with a problem in it. Somebody made an opinion and you bought into it. And it, came, it became your child's reality. Ain't no daddy at home disorder. Ain't no daddy at home disorder. ADHD is nothing more than ain't no daddy at home disorder. It is an outgrowth of the war on black men. When is the first time we get ADHD as a diagnosis? 1980. When does the mass incarceration war against black men start? 1980. When did the CIA drop, drop cocaine off in the black community? 1980. This is no coincidence. We're going to send their fathers to jail and we're going to give them the same crack that they fathers sold so they can sit still long enough to learn about Christopher Columbus. <laughs> and we're going to do it with their parents' permission. <laughs> Public school is a weapon of mass destruction. Two more reasons why we get children tested. One is nomothetic versus ideographic information. What is that? Nomothetic means what? I want to compare your son's skill to the next kid. I want to compare your daughter's skill to the next kid. I want to see how well he does compared to everybody else in his class. That's nomothetic. Ideographic, I want to compare his math skill to his own writing skill. I want to compare his writing skill to his own reading skill. So nomothetic is when we compare the child to other children. Ideographic is when we compare the child to themselves in other areas. Everybody clear on that? Yes. Now y'all need to be careful about standardized testing. 
Talk about this for me. Standardized testing. No child left behind. Detroit Public School Achievement Test. Why are your kids taking so many tests? Why are they tested in the fall? They tested in the spring. They tested for IQ. They tested for special ed. They tested for ADHD, which is a joke. They tested for this, and they tested for that, and they tested for this, and there's a million tests out there. Every child in America being tested like crazy. Do you know why? <clears throat> tests are given to produce a result that was already concluded before the test was given out. The tests that they give black kids in Detroit are designed for the black children to fail. Now you say, how do you know that? Are you making excuses for underachieving black children? No. I participated in standardization of the most popular IQ test in America, the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. Okay? And when tests are made, what do they do? There's a process called standardization. When you hear standardized tests, what does that mean when they say, we're going to give your child a standardized test? It's a if it's a standardized test, that means the scores have been distributed along a bell curve. Everybody with me? A bell curve. According to the bell curve theory, most kids who take the test will score within the middle of the bell. Some kids will score at the top of the bell. They will do extremely well. And then some kids will score at the bottom of the bell. They will do extremely poor. This is what you need to know about the bell. No matter how good all the children do, and no matter how poorly all the children do, some must fail by design of the bell. Some must do well because of the design of the bell. Make me understand this, Dr. Umar. You are my students, and this is 12th grade. Y'all all take a test. Everyone in here scores between 95 and 98 on this test. You are all three points within one another on this test. 95, 96, 97, 98, three, four points, right? When we put the scores on a bell curve, the child who got the 98 is in the top percentile. The child who got the 93 is at the bottom. If you look at the bell curve, it will mislead you to make you think your child did extremely poor because they're at the bottom of the bell. But what nobody's telling you is that your child is only at the bottom of the bell because he had a 93 and everybody else had 94s, 95s, 96s. In other words, they could have been this close. But because it's a bell, you automatically space the scores out and make the kids who do poorly make it look like they did a whole lot worse than what they did. Are y'all following me? And the kids who did really well didn't really do so well. They just happened to be a few points above the others. But the bell curve is designed to make sure you got winners and losers on every test. I need you to understand this. <clears throat> there will always be failing students, no matter if they get a 95 or not, on the bell curve. There will always be kids at the 99th percentile. Because the bell curve is designed to do what? Group kids. Group them. First of all, we only test the group. We only test the group. We don't test to see how well you've done. We test the group. And why do we test the group? Because America is a society that is based on giving privilege to some and denying it to everybody else. So inherent in the test development is the biasness of American society. Let me make it a whole lot simpler. If every child was being prepared for college, why do you have college prep classes for some and not for all? Are y'all following me? Because the school's job is not to prepare everybody. Public school's job is to choose the few who will make it and the most who will go to jail. This is built into it. Let me give it to you another way. 
Every black child in Detroit in September scores a perfect score on the Detroit Public School Standard Achievement Test, whatever one they use. All y'all children get a hundred perfect score on that test. Do you know what happens to the test next year? That goes in the trash and they get a new one. Because the purpose of the test was not to produce a result that said all the black kids did extremely well. That is not why we are giving out tests. We are giving out tests to show that they don't do well. Tests would not be given at all if black kids outperform European American students. You only get tests because they're designed to make sure our kids do less well. If your kids start doing better than their kids, there will be no more testing. Because it no longer serves the purpose of excluding students of color from access to opportunity and resources. In other words, if all the Detroit kids have a perfect score on the test, why are there so few blacks in Detroit colleges? If all the black kids are doing well, you got to explain so few jobs for blacks in Detroit. In other words, if the test, if the test scores are good, the society got a lot of explaining to do. If the test scores are bad, you don't have to explain nothing. So when people say, why we ain't got more black men in college, why we ain't got more black men working, because they too stupid. Haven't you seen the public school test scores? Three quarters of Detroit students are below basic. So the reason you ain't got no black doctors and lawyers and psychologists is because these people obviously are intellectually inferior. My point is the test must do what it's doing in order for the society to continue the way that it is. If you're not interested in denying people opportunity, you don't test. You would only test for serious, true disorders. Autism, blindness, hearing impairment, orthopedic impairment, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, true medical problems. But when you test it for fabricated disorders, it's only to justify exclusion of black youth. And then we already talked about number five, you test for special ed versus clinical. Now, all psychological diagnoses are what? Professional opinions. All psychological diagnoses are professional. I'm an expert, but at the end of the day, my diagnosis is still a what? Opinion. Y'all need to understand this, for you and for your children. And what's the popular disorder now for black people in America? Bipolar. You wanna go talk to somebody about your problems? Bipolar. My mom died, I need some counseling. Bipolar. I just got a divorce. Bipolar. My side hurt. Bipolar! <laughs> Every 10 years, there's a diagnosis of choice for black people. To do what? Make sure the psychologists get paid for seeing you. We don't get paid if we don't diagnose you. You know that, right? So if you come to my clinic, you won't get a damn label. Because I don't get paid if I don't get you one. Trying to make this real direct for y'all. This is about cash. This is about money. This ain't about helping nobody. Most psychologists don't even do therapy no more. Because they say it ain't enough money in it. And if you really want to get you a good therapist, what they going to charge you? $200 an hour? Now, I'm a psychologist, but I don't know what the hell can be going on for $200 an hour. What's so special? What are they saying to you? That's worth two hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> I'm a psych. Somebody help me out. <laughs> Some of y'all walk around bragging. My therapist is two hundred dollars an hour. <laughs> and what do y'all talk about? <clears throat> Hair and nails the whole session. <laughs> I had one person came up to me say, "Doctor Umar, I'm my therapist. Therapist. Damn. <laughs> they done remix the whole thing." They treat the therapist. That therapist coming. What are we talking about today? <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. Yeah. This is real. What is the number one reason that psychologists lose their license? Most psychologists in America are kicked out, prevented from being psychologists for what violation? Misdiagnosis. Name misdiagnosis. The whole industry goes to misdiagnosis. You keep your job for misdiagnosis. Oh, inappropriate. Sexual relations with their clients. If you don't believe me, go to the American Psychological Association website, APA.org. 
click on the monitor, the APA's magazine, go to the last page, and look at all the psychologists in America who were stripped of their license for falling in love with their clients. Here's what I don't understand. You went to college for 10 years studying the mind. You took out student loans, you had to pass tests, you had to do a dissertation, you had to put up with racism. You got all this money, you gotta pay back. And you wanna throw all that away for some crazy cookies. <laughs> <laughs> You doing therapy with a man or a woman, if you're a man, a woman, and if you're a woman, a man, or well, we ain't gonna get into that, but <laughs> my point is, if you're dealing with a psychologically unhealthy person, and you create an emotional attachment there, and you go beyond the boundaries of your professional duty, this is a psychologically unhealthy person. What do you think they're gonna do the minute you cut off the attachment bond? Dial your ass in. Yes. I was sleeping with Dr. Umar, my therapist. Do something! It happens all across the country. I know guys who lost their license. What are you doing, man? No, no, no discipline. Because what you're doing is you're abusing the therapist, client, relationship, the privilege there. So as far as I'm concerned, you shouldn't lose your license. The minute I'm doing therapy with a child and I notice that the mother's starting to put me in the father's room psychologically, I give up the case. Now most people say, that's cold blooded. How are you just gonna walk away from the kid? I didn't wanna walk away from the kid. I love the kid, but this right here ain't healthy. And I can't risk this being turned into something it ain't. Cause I got mouths to feed, including mine. <laughs> people say, Umar, you just dropped the case. You damn right I dropped the case because the mother started to like me. So I'm out. That'll drop the case. <laughs> dialing me up, had me on YouTube. Tell me you lost the seat. Yeah. I saw a hand. Okay. But remember, all psychological diagnoses are opinions. They're not facts. You make them facts. Four aspects of an evaluation. There's four aspects of an evaluation. First aspect is information collection. Listen to me well. If your child is evaluated and the psychologist doesn't call you to interview you, reject the report. I'm going to tell you what they do in Detroit. Because they do it in Philly, New York. You know what they do? When they test your child, they don't even call you up. These black parents, we ain't talking to them. I'm the expert the hell on what they think. And they give you a report saying your child is learning to say, well, they didn't even have a conversation with you. They don't know if the child was born full term, if they went to preschool. Anybody in their family might have died recently that could affect the way they perform. They don't care about what you think. And you know what's sad? We don't even make sure they care about what we think. It is disrespectful to give a parent an evaluation report without talking to the parent. You are the most important person in the evaluation process. Y'all are what helped me make sense of my test because all I got is numbers, y'all. The test is numbers. I gotta make sense of those numbers. And the only way I'm gonna make sense of those numbers is to talk to you.